Good evening and welcome to the latest in what someone else has labeled Purdue University's Presidential Lecture Series. Over the last few years, our series has welcomed great scientists, entrepreneurs, and other business leaders, renowned journalists, and a number of esteemed public officials, past and present. But rarely have we hosted guests more significant than those joining us tonight for a topic more timely and crucial to our national future. Tonight's special for a second reason. I have a co-sponsor for this program, a unique two-year-old student organization named the Political Discourse Club. Among the more than a thousand student organizations at Purdue, this one stands out for its mission of bringing together people of disparate viewpoints to discuss and debate their conflicting ideas in an atmosphere of mutual respect and civility. Our profound thanks to Chairman Sunil Green and the Political Discourse Club for proposing and helping conceive and arrange tonight's program. We're joined tonight by two of America's most admired and consequential public officials. Paul Ryan, former Speaker of the House and Vice Presidential Candidate, and Senator Heidi Heitkamp, who served her state of North Dakota in multiple capacities, culminating in her role as a U.S. Senator. Beyond their legislative accomplishments, these two individuals were known for performing their public service with openness, friendliness, and a desire to seek out common ground. They're ideally suited to help us explore the questions, what's next for our democracy, and its corollary, can we be one nation again? Senator and Mr. Speaker, thank you for participating. Um, as we start, I, I've, I've got to tell you, uh, Speaker Ryan, Paul, uh, we've known each other a long time, but preparing for tonight, I, I found there was something important I didn't know. Amid, amid your many uh, uh, <clears throat> achievements, you drove the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile as a college job. <laughs> and yeah, I, apparently it was down in Dallas, and it jackknifed on the highway and went into the um, ditch, <laughs> and a bunch of friends of mine sent me photos of that, saying if a Wisconsinite like you were driving it, this would never have happened. I am so envious. I have all, every time I've seen one of those, I've wondered now what kind of person gets that uh, assignment. Yeah, <laughs> now summer I, college kid job. Now I know. Well, in any event, uh, uh, Senator, I'm not sure you can top that. You've had a great career, but uh, uh, I think you'd agree that nothing to quite match uh, Paul's uh, uh, that in Paul's it, resume. But yeah, uh, let it, me start by. Hard. It's hard to beat something that glamorous. It really is. My view, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, let me start by asking you both. And uh, the, the questions I have, and by the way, uh, our student participants will uh, be here in the second part of the program with their own questions. And we want to mainly look forward, but I think we uh, maybe need to start with some diagnosis of the problems which are troubling so many Americans. And so let me ask uh, you this question. Uh, was the last president uh, more a cause or more a symptom of the incivility uh, and the, uh, as we say, tribalism that now afflicts the country? I guess, Paul, you can go ahead and then I'll contradict you. I was just trying to be polite, Heidi. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd say he was a symptom and an accelerant. Uh, clearly, We've seen um, the rise in tribalism in America. Um, I describe it as we have these entertainment wings of both of our parties, where in the old days, like 10 years ago, if you wanted to succeed in politics, you had to prove yourself uh, through a meritocracy, through, through legislation and persuasion that it was the best policy ideas and things like that. Lately, because of cable, internet, digital, all these different multimedia platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you can just entertain yourself into fame and leapfrog the meritocracy, and that breeds polarization. It disallows compromise and common ground, and frankly, in many cases, common sense. And Donald Trump was the ultimate performer of this. So in a field of 17 people running, you know, who was the, he was my 17th choice. I made that pretty clear at the time, but he was the ultimate performer, the ultimate entertainer, leapfrogged, vanquished all of his opponents, and that is the system we sort of had and the rewards that it has today. And then I think he was just more of an accelerant. So I would say he was the ultimate symptom of this dynamic in society. And then he accelerated it by just doubling down on tweets and all of the rest of it. And uh, yes, it's divisive and yes, it's polarizing. 
And yes, I'd say it, 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 it's great for ratings for websites and TV and all the rest. Uh, it's not great for our pol politics and our political system. Senator, um, granted that uh, he, he was some of both, more a cause, more a symptom, and, it, and, it, and uh, as a symptom, uh, was he a symptom of anything else beyond what uh, Paul just uh, uh, talked about? I, I'd like to word, use a word like reflection. He was more a reflection of the divisions that then he, as uh, the speaker has said, accelerated. But he did something beyond that. He went out and did like the largest focus groups in the history of America using his rally to test theories, to test anger, to test division, and then exploited it and blew it up. But he did something that, that I think the Republican Party will have to figure out long term. And that is he basically invited people to the political discourse in a very front row center seat that have never been invited before. Um, and by that I mean white supremacist groups, groups like the Oath Keepers, groups like the Proud Boys, that he purposely did not ever want to alienate. And now these groups had front row center in the Republican Party, and it's really hard to distract yourself. Um, and, and you think about QAnon, why would anyone in any political party embrace those theories? But yet here we are. And so I think that he took it one step beyond what I think anyone has ever taken this level of division before by inviting people who literally, literally peddle hate in their political discourse to the table and legitimize them. And that's, a, that's a, something that we all need to be deeply concerned about but I think especially someone who's concerned about the future of the Republican Party. Paul, you want to say anything more to that? Well, first, I'd say those groups are disgusting, vile groups that have no place in the Republican Party, period, end of statement. Um, if you ask me who the Proud Boys are or the Oath Keepers or QAnon a year or two ago, I'd never heard of them. Um, so they should be disavowed. They need to be disavowed. I clearly disavow them. Um, I would say one thing he did do also, though, Heidi, is he brought a lot of disaffected blue-collar workers into the party. I can just tell you from running around Wisconsin, not unlike Indiana and North Dakota, you had the forgotten men and women who felt that globalization, technology, trade, whatever, passed them on in the 20th century. My own town of Janesville, we lost our GM plant, and everybody lost a great-paying job in our town, only to be replaced by, you know, 30 to 40 percent of the salary they were making. And people were really upset about that. And he spoke to them and he brought them in the Republican Party. So uh, I can speak with just personal experiences. He brought a lot of disaffected blue collar workers into the party. Also, those elements you mentioned that he breathed life into or gave some kind of normalcy to, which is totally wrong. This Q thing is just a crazy conspiracy theory. Frankly, I think we have a real problem with conspiracy theories now, partly because not just of Donald Trump because of just the way the internet works and the way these things ping around the universe before the truth gets out. And leaders have a responsibility to tamp those down. And that's where he would miserably fail on that front. Well, I want to come back. Yeah, and if I, can the, just, we'll if back I can just add yeah. the blue collar, I, I totally agree with Paul. When I started out in politics, my base was blue collar workers. The Democratic Party professes and sees themselves as a reflection of who, what their values are. The party of the little guy, we've lost the little guy. And we need to look very, very closely at how that happened. Very important point. And we will come back to that, I'm sure, at, uh, before we're done tonight. Let me uh, ask you this question with regard to uh, our divided society. Um, common threats or common enemies have, have been commonly uh, one way that the society's got past that. In fact, it's been a tactic of, of some uh, leaders in, in, in past societies we can all name to either manufacture one or find a, a common enemy. Um, uh, now, uh, we had one in COVID. We have one. It has not uh, apparently brought the country together. In some ways, it seemed to exacerbate the, the uh, partisanship and the, and the differences. I, mo I move to ask you this question. Uh, 
if 9-11 happened today, would the country rally together even temporarily as it uh, did uh, now a couple decades ago? Well, I'll, oh. I'll go first. Oh, please. I, I mean, I, I think when you look at the early days of COVID, and when the president was addressing the country, that's some of the highest ratings the president received during his presidency. And there's a reason for that because that rallying cry to come together. And then after a period of time, when people started saying, well, you're not doing enough, this isn't happening. Then that's when you saw the political divisions enter into all of this. And so I, I firmly believe if we had a 9-11, we would rally together as a country and fight it together um, the way we need to, but we need that leadership that continues or provides the continuity. Thank you, Paul. I think so, I think we would rally. I'd give one caveat and one reservation, which is um, I, I do worry about the, the acceleration of conspiracy theories these days. And I think with 9-11, you would, you know, there was a bizarre conspiracy theory then that got nowhere. Um, I worry in today's digital environment that that might not quite be the case. But nevertheless, I think our country would have overcome it. And it was kind of a moment. The difference with COVID is it's lasted a long time and it's, it's just wrecked the economy and it's wrecked small businesses. And the lockdowns and the debate about lockdowns has just really frayed the edges of society. And just so many people have lost their jobs and so many small business people, lots of friends of mine have just lost their livelihoods because of the lockdowns. So that's always gonna stress and strain a community, I mean, a country. Um, I think with 9-11, yes, I do think we would rally. But I think we'd have to worry about the, the bizarre conspiracy theories that just getting more life these days because of the way our digital system works. Uh, Ed, to uh, return to a topic that uh, you broached a, a minute ago, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, perhaps the biggest change in society since 9-11 has been the advent or the onrush of uh, not just of the Internet and social media in particular. It's affecting us in ways that, that uh, uh, people are only beginning, I think, to uh, analyze and identify. To what extent uh, is it a material factor in the uh, mutual hostility, the division, the tribalism yeah. that is making politics and government so, uh, so uh, difficult right now? I really worry about this. this is, I teach down the road in South Bend at Notre Dame. I'm a diehard Badger fan, yet I'm wearing Northwestern colors today. So I guess I'm keeping it in the Big Ten, but I, I probably should have picked a better shirt today. Uh, but I digress. Uh, I taught a class on political um, polarization last semester at Notre Dame. And, and if you dig deep into this, there have always been anxiety. There have been different anxieties. And what the digital social media platforms do is it really trudges up and gives life to these anxieties. And the problem we now have is you can make money on an anxiety. You can make, a person can make money and monetize polarization and anger and those kinds of darker emotions. They're good for hits, they're good for clicks, they're good for ratings, and they can be monetized. And what I would call um, political opportunists can, can seize that, jump on that and ride that. This is a new challenge to self-government and to democracy of the likes that we've not really seen before. Which means each of us, not just like political leaders, but community leaders, civic leaders, business leaders, academic leaders, have got to work much, much harder to try and overcome these challenges and to revitalize civil society, which is that space between ourselves and our government where we actually lead our lives to get us to put you know, our tablets and our phones down uh, and to, work with one another, experience one another, and get people out of their comfort zones, out of their homogeneity, you know, societies, and integrate with one another. This, these are the things I do uh, work on at my American Idea Foundation. My, I have a poverty foundation that seeks to try and bridge gaps to get suburbanites into the deep inner cities and get inner cities out to the d deep rural areas and to try and get people to kind of cross-pollinate and find common ground so that we can find solutions. Long story short, Mitch, is we've got to find ways to revitalize civil society and to put aside these new challenges and to pick leaders that endeavor to do so versus those who try to ride the division to the top. Thank you. Senator, uh, you uh, uh, won and, and lost elections before and, and after the uh, advent of the uh, 
of all these phenomena. Uh, how do you see the effect they've had on uh, our politics and, and then beyond that, uh, the uh, practices of government? Well, it's interesting because I think if you if you were in fact um, you know speaking to somebody who runs one of these platforms, what they would say is to blame us for what's happening in America makes as much sense as blaming the bulletin board outside the super value here in North Dakota where you post your you know your rent you know you got an apartment for rent um, uh, kind of uh, advertisement. Um, it is way more complicated than that. And I agree with Paul that there has to be some analysis of what happens. But the real trick for all of us is to build a more literate, resilient population who doesn't listen to this and automatically say, oh, that's the truth because it's coming from this platform or it's coming from that platform, but uses critical thinking skills. I blame, as, as I think the speaker was uh, 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 kind of uh, alluding to that the lack and the breakdown of kind of civil discourse at a very local level. I mean, what's happening to the local newspaper? Who's having a dialogue in the no local newspaper? I always say, you know, in, in my small town growing up of Manador, you know, you had Democrats, you had Republicans, you had Packers fans, you had uh, Vikings fans. That's about as much diversion as what we, division as what we had. Um, but, but all these people would come together and they debate the issues at a table and people would self-correct as they listen to that dialogue. And the other thing about leadership is they would figure out maybe they didn't agree on politics or who they're going to vote for, but they could get the lights on the Christmas tree at Christmas time, you know, in the town square. And that kind of civil local engagement and dialogue is not happening in America. It's happening on Facebook pages. And so it, it just becomes amplified in a way that is not healthy. And how you recreate that, I think, is, and whether you can recreate it, 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 if you can, will create a resiliency to kind of the crazy that's out there that people will automatically go, oh, I don't believe that. As you were talking, I, I'm afraid a few of our, our students at least might have been asking each other, what's a newspaper? Um, <laughs> Um, or let alone you know, the, the, uh, well, you know, I think the, the, the fact that a lot of people have, have fastened on is that, that despite their protestations, these platforms are more than that. They are uh, selecting in many cases what we will see and read. They are uh, reacting to what we see and read by shoveling us more of that. And um, now we discover in many cases uh, shutting down uh, uh, views that they or somebody thinks may uh, uh, may. Uh, not be favored. Let me ask about the what we've thought of as the more traditional media. I don't think they can be exonerated either. And read you just a quick uh, line from a recent uh, column where uh, the, the, the writer uh, really uh, disputed the idea that these are uh, purely neutral purveyors of information, said ultimately today's news media and social media make their money on conflict and catastrophe and on anger. Uh, media outlets today, with few exceptions, want their audiences angry. The angrier, the better. Is that fair? Paul? Yeah, that's what I was saying earlier. Look, uh, I remember talking to one of my local newspapers, the Racine Journal Times, and, uh, and, and, and having an argument with a reporter who was asking my, my vote on a particular issue, and he started arguing with me about it. I'm like, wait a second, aren't you supposed to just take my quote, put it in, and then write the article objectively and report on this issue. He says, no, I disagree with you. I'm going to write against this. I'm like, oh, is this an editorial? It's like, no, I'm just writing this as an article for the paper. So I called his editor, and he proceeded to tell me, we've adopted a new standard we call advocacy journalism, not objective journalism, where we're going to advocate within our articles for a position because that's what our readers want. This was like 10 years ago, uh, and it was kind of a, a, an eye-opener for me. And, and, and the long story short is I think this industry, newspapers in particular, but also frankly, TV and cable are getting displaced by big tech. They're losing their revenue. And so they're doing everything they can to try and chase eyeballs, hits and clicks and revenue. So that's a real challenge. So I think this is all built upon a foundation of moral relativism, which has pervaded society, throw on top algorithms, mathematics and tech, and you have yourself a witch's brew of toxicity, of polarization, 
because you, in order to survive and keep a business model working, you've got to stir people to your website. And that is the darker emotions, not hope and, and, and aspiration and good feelings, but, but anxiety, fear, and anger. And that is unfortunately how we get out of this. I just wish, I, I think we got to attack the root cause of moral relativism and that's not government. That's family, that's parents, that's, that's, that's people, that's community, that's civil society. And that's not a really clean, crisp answer, but I think it's the best one that we have these days. Senator, uh, anything you want to uh, add to that Pollyanna view we just heard? <laughs> you know, I, I think you say, what is the cause? The cause is people wanting that kind of content. I mean, you know, if, if I, if, you know, think about new Coke. Um, you know, mm. Coca-Cola decided they're going to abandon their old formula and put out something they thought was new. The people rejected it overwhelmingly, no matter how many focus groups they did where people liked in a blind test taste the new Coke better. And, and my point is, what is it about us as a people? that motivates us towards fear, that motivates us towards these um, darker images, the, this judgment image. And that's really what it is, this, this idea that I can criticize you because I feel better about myself when I do that. You know, that that is something, as Paul said, you've got to look at families, you've got to look at individuals, you've got to look at what it is at a, at a very basic human level that we need to address. I, I also think you have to look at it from above. And when you have a leader who is motivated and knows that he's going to be successful, and I mean President Trump, in um, in dividing and making people mad, and then you think about that great speech, uh, inaugural speech that President Kennedy gave, which really called on all of us to address this from our better angels, and then asked us when we're all together um, that that we come together. And so, how how do we get leadership that? is skilled at motivating to the positive and not the negative. So it's a top up and a bottom down um, problem, but at the heart of it is they're gonna give you what sells. And so let's figure out how we can get people to want a different product. I'll, I'll digress for one second, Mitch, and just say identity politics is a root cause part of this problem. It's an accelerant in this wrong direction. Both parties practice this. This used to come from the left, from Solominsky and that crowd. But the right now plays identity politics. Question that people like me and, and like-minded you know, Republican leaders are trying to figure out is, how do we get rid of identity politics and how do we make successful, inclusive, aspirational politics so that the ambitious people coming into politics see that that's the right way to go and they wanna pursue Reagan-like aspirational, inclusive politics? How do we make that cool again so that the really ambitious people who are, it's ambition over everything else, don't grab the identity politics, you know, wheel and grab the wheel of Reagan and aspiration. I'm an old Jack Kemp guy, you know that. How do we grab that inclusive aspirational wheel? And we have yet to figure out how to do that. And both sides, both sides have, have grabbed this identity politics uh, play and they're, they, they played it very successfully. You know, think about, think about President Trump, incredibly charismatic. What if he had used that charisma to unite the country? Mm -hmm. Um, wouldn't that have been wonderful? <laughs> but it didn't happen. And that's why I'm saying it can't just come from families and individuals. It has to come from the example that we in leadership provide to the public. Well, uh, in, in pursuit of, of some uh, uh, unity, uh, and let's hope that it doesn't come through a, a, a mortal threat or an attack on the uh, United States, um, I want to ask if there are, if you can identify areas, issues, topics um, that might serve uh, to bring Americans together. Let's recognize that there's very little overlap in Congress anymore. Uh, and very few uh, uh, of either party uh, <clears throat> finding it in their conscience to vote with the other party. Uh, so this uh, will be harder than it maybe has ever been. But are there are there issues that you can think of? where uh, um, th these, uh, this uh, division might be bridged and the country might be given a, a couple examples of, uh, of how a compromise and cooperation can effectively work. Paul, can you go first? Yeah, uh, I think China and the challenge with China and the great power struggle that's in front of us today is definitely a bipartisan issue. I've spoken with just as many Democrats lately as Republicans on this. 
Uh, decoupling of China is occurring. Joe Biden sounded like Donald Trump, just with obviously different style on the issue. And I think that's something that you're going to see a lot of um, uh, bipartisanship on. Um, an issue that it has to be tackled, that can be tackled, I tried it and, and had a tweet that threw off my vote count, um, is immigration. Bush tried it. Uh, Obama tried it. Uh, it's been tried, but that's an issue where there is a center. Uh, I've tried to put together a lot of deals. I broke my pick, you know, whacking against the, the stone on this one. But if we can get an immigration deal, which I do think can be done, um, staying within the 40 yard lines, both parties, I think that would be really good for the country. Um, and I think there is a sweet spot there. So a uh, volatile issue like immigration, if it can be overcome, would be a real confidence builder for the country. And then things that we're already on, in sync on, ex, uh, infrastructure, China policy, you know, there are a lot of things. When I was the last term of speaker, we passed 1,172 bills out of the House. That's about double the production of a session in legislature. Usually you pass about 600. We did almost 1,200. About 600 of them made it into law. Over 80% of those bills were bipartisan bills. So opioid, um, a, a big thing on opioids, criminal justice reform, the Cancer Moonshot Cures Act. I can go on and on and on. The point I'm making, Mitch, is the system still actually does work. But all those bipartisan reforms, which were generational changing reforms, passed without much notice in the media, without any, any great notice because we all got along and we got together and we got stuff done. It happened under the radar with the microphones turned off. And then when we were fighting each other tooth and nail on TV, that's when the Klieg lights turned on. And that's when we got a lot of press. And that's what people remember. So the good news in this story is Congress still can and does work and can still get stuff done. Um, and then if you have the kind of leadership that tries to really promote those things, you know, maybe you can break through and show that we can, we can walk and chew at the same time. Before we go to Heidi, uh, uh, first, just an observation. My sense is those things that you just talked about happened on the radar. The media just wasn't interested in them because they did, it, didn't, it, it didn't fit the uh, criteria, right, right. Uh, which, uh, you know, sells uh, clicks and sells ads and so forth. Uh, b before we ask the senator to comment, uh, just for the benefit of the audience, uh, Paul, what's between the 40-yard lines? What would be the elements of an immigration bill that you think might attract a majority support and some from both sides? I could take two hours. I'll try and take six sentences, four sentences. Um, a path of citizenship where the person doesn't get cut, cousin, cut in line, but has to pay a fine is at the back of the line. For the dreamers, you give them um, automatic um, visas and then allow themselves to earn a green card, which gets them to a path of citizenship. And then they call it chain migration. That, that, that word offends some people, but it's, it's a way of saying switch from family-based immigration to economic-based immigration while keeping nuclear families intact. So the visa categories that keep a nuclear family, keep that intact. But the, the longer distant relatives convert those visas to economic-based visas to get the economy what it needs because of birth rates, we're going to have labor shortages and we need to address those. We need people to help milk cows in Western Wisconsin. Silicon Valley needs entrepreneurs. Healthcare is going to need a lot of people with baby boomers retiring. So gravitate toward a Canadian-like, um, Immigration system to give visas based on economic need, keep nuclear families intact, and then give the dreamers who know no other country a pathway. And then to get the, the issue of, of amnesty off, don't give amnesty, but give people a way, a reasonable way um, to normalize their, their condition and their, and their place. That was less than and two hours, so th thanks. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, Senator, uh, issues, these and others on which uh, people might agree and, and put on the list either to dismiss or to include uh, some regulation of the, of the big tech and social media. I think I hear people from both sides concerned, maybe for different reasons, about that topic. Well, first off, I, I would remind everybody that the Senate, in a very bipartisan way, um, sitting in our desks and marking the moment, did in fact pass comprehensive immigration reform with almost 70 votes. It, it, it died and withered on the vine in the House. And I don't blame the speaker for that, but clearly there was an opportunity that was missed there because people, again, found a better way to 
threaten people to say, you know, this mm -hmm. isn't good for you, um, and instead of saying this is what's good for America. You know, I think it's interesting because we talk about China. Why? I mean, China um, is is fairly remote for people. People kind of get that it's out there, but. The, the reason why civic leaders are very concerned about China and very interested in strategies is because China is now going to emerge, I think, in the next couple of years as the largest economy in the world. Um, they have 1.4, 1.3, 1.4 billion people. That's a large consumption base that um, people who want to export uh, look at very closely. And, and the challenges for us in, in China are really, is America going to maintain its dominance, its economic position? You know, China is going to form a cryptocurrency. A lot of people thinking that the dollar no longer will be the reserve currency. And what does that mean to Amer American uh, dominance, economic dominance, which we think has led to the growth and the promotion of liberal democracy across the world and the promotion of peace. And so this is a big, big issue. But it's going to be really, re it's, it's, it's a really complicated issue, but I think one that we could come together on. I, I, I think that when we look at economic justice, and it's something that, that I know Paul has worked really hard on, we approach it from a different standpoint, but, but I will tell you, I think both sides realize that you cannot have this level of economic inequality, whether it is income inequality or wealth inequality, and really maintain a balanced economy moving forward. How do you address that? Now, that's the problem. The problem is that if you sat down with Americans and said, what kind of America do you want to live in? It wouldn't matter if they're Democrats, Republicans, Independents, you know, Green Party, they would all give you the same answer. The question is, how do you get there? And that takes political leadership skills. And you've got to want to lead the institution of the Senate or the House Rather, and, and, and I think Paul's a great example of this. You got to lead the institution and not be a political leader. And I think way too often our leaders of these, this great Congress and this great institution, Article One branch of government, are political leaders. They're not leaders of these institutions. And so um, I, I really think that there is an opportunity. Um, Joe Biden is a creature of the Senate. He has a lot of friends there. He understands the legislature. But I, I will tell you that if you want unity in this country and you want to move things forward, get out of Washington, D.C. and start talking to the people of this country because we're less divided. And uh, when, when the motivation is power and winning, you aren't going to get anything other than fear and, and division. Um, when it's getting things done for America, that table that I was talking about at the coffee shop, they know how to get things done. Go out and visit with them. Thanks. As, as I uh, indicated earlier, we now have a series of questions from the host group and their and their constituent groups. They have drawn together in the Political Discourse Club, uh, other uh, organizations across the spectrum of this campus. I think it's one of the uh, great developments that we've seen at Purdue recently, and I want to commend the, uh, all those involved once again. So they'll introduce themselves. I'll ask our two respondents to be a little bit concise because we've got several questions to get through. And uh, the first of them, I believe, comes from uh, the uh, uh, the uh, founding group. But let's hear it. Let's uh, hear them in the order we uh, receive them. Hello, my name is Shai Robinson, and I'm currently a freshman studying political science with a minor in Spanish, and I am from Fort Wayne, Indiana. I would just like to take this time to thank President Mitch Daniels and Mr. Paul Ryan and Mrs. Heidi Heikamp for coming and speaking with us tonight. In a nation where political views are in constant opposition of each other, and those with opposite ideologies are seen as enemies rather than respectful opponents, how do you get a white minimum wage worker in Bismarck, North Dakota, to care about the problems of a Chinese immigrant in Madison, mm -hmm. Wisconsin, who faces social stigmatization due to COVID-19? What responsibility do politicians have to diffuse the increase in political polarization, and how can college students apply this to their lives? Thank you. Paul, go first. Uh, you want me to answer the Bismarck? So, um, <laughs> smart I think, question. Yeah, first of all, Shai, that was exciting. That was great. It should go, it should and go I, to the senators. You know, You're right. I, I, I know uh, Fort Wayne yeah. pretty well. A bunch of Janesville people from the GM plant moved to Fort Wayne, so I've got some friends down there. Um, I think you need to articulate a political philosophy and view of life as a leader that seeks to unify and inform and inspire people. 
What I mean when I say that is, uh, for instance, I, I served in Congress for 20 years. Uh, I have a pretty big Hispanic diaspora in Racine and Kenosha, some towns I represented. And I always did uh, uh, Spanish town hall meetings with an interpreter. And, and, and I got, you know, people in the rural areas would give me a hard time about that. And then I would ask them to come join me with these. Uh, I, would, I would try to explain to people how we, this is a melting pot, how when my Irish ancestors came over, and during the potato famine, they were kicked to the curb. They could only get jobs as firefighters or policemen or construction workers. My family did construction. And we were not really well received either. And we need to change that in society. So I think there's a history of this. It's just been accelerated by technology. And I think it is really incumbent upon leaders to try and articulate a vision of inclusion, of assimilation, and our common goals, our common humanity, the common theme of opportunity, upward mobility. We want a free society that is safe and prosperous and full of opportunity. And this is what people are seeking. And oh, by the way, they're creating jobs, they're adding, they're contributing. These are good things. And you have to go out of your way to point those out. And you have to lean into it a little bit. Meaning when you get that constituent from Bismarck or from Janesville pushing back on you on this, you have to push back and appeal to the common humanity and see if you can open a person up. Um, you have to do that. The alternative is you could just say, yeah, absolutely, feed the populism, ride the populism, and take it to a dark place, which is regrettably what I think a lot of ambitious politicians, again, on, on all sides, are doing these days for a short, quick fix of quick popularity. It comes at the expense of, of the common good, frankly. And I always tell new people in Congress, don't, you're not in such a race. The, the tortoise wins the race here. Be good, be diligent, be hardworking, be true, be honest, and don't be so flash in the pan. Don't be such a, a, a entertainer on TV. Be a legislator, and you will have deeper, longer-lasting respect and a, be a better leader at the end of the day. But so many people are tempted to the quick fix of fame that you can get if you inflame, and, and that is a real problem in our politics today. Senator, what do you uh, what do you say to that uh, worker in uh, Bismarck? Um, people are afraid of what they don't know, and what they've never experienced, and so there has to be an understanding and uniting of common experiences. You know, I I I I find it interesting because frequently in North Dakota, people say, "Well, you know, we." really hard here and we pay our taxes and we're paying our taxes and working hard when people in in cities don't work hard and i said well you know i i i don't know that that's true um and and you know it's easy to say yeah yeah they're they're bad people and we're really getting taken advantage of and what the speaker just said is, it is incumbent on all of us to back up and say, no, let me tell you about my experience. Let me tell you why I think it's important that you have an understanding of um, a Chinese immigrant's experience coming to this country and what they've lived through and why they bring such a richness and an opportunity to grow this country and grow this economy. Um, you know, what it comes down to is a couple things. Number one, lazy politicians who don't want to do that, who find it easier to demonize, and uh, because that that uh, uh, takes care of quote unquote mm -hmm. the base, as opposed to kind of educating and leading. Um, I think the other thing is that that we haven't, um, as a society, uh, really brought each other along. And that's always been true. I, I was part of a program once where George Mitchell, who um, uh, uh, was the leader of the Senate, now just a statesman. If there's a definition of a statesman, he certainly qualifies there. And when people went through this, oh, look what's happening in our society, he, get, he gave a little history lesson to remind us all that people of German heritage uh, who came about the same time the Irish came, you know, I'm German, you know, no Germans, dogs are Irish allowed. You know, you know, we've always had this challenge of uniting the country when we've had great leaders. And, and I would include um, Ronald Reagan, who did an immigration reform bill, who brought the country together, explained why it was important that we, we, we unite this country in a common American identity, and that that's 
all of our roles. I think, I think that what we're missing in all of this is leadership, but we also are missing proximity because we've now decided that it, that, you know, if you live in New York, you're going to think this way. If you live in Bismarck, you're going to think that way. And we've got to start getting out of this mentality of, um, pigeonholing ideology into various regional uh, baskets and start thinking about how we can uh, weave a common American identity. And that takes leadership and it takes patience and it takes civil society. Um, by that, I mean the churches to stand up and say, you know, this is why this is important. It takes um, uh, public leaders, education leaders, um, universities like the great one that we're talking to today that has a rich culture of inclusion um, that, that many people from Janesville or Bismarck, North Dakota who attend Purdue are gonna get exposed to people and those experiences. And that exposure is gonna change the world and certainly change um, their, their worldview. Well, that was, uh, uh, Shai gave us such a great question. We got two great answers, but they were a little long. So uh, in the interest of making sure that the next several great questions get answered, uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's go to the uh, next panelist. Hello, I'm Allison Hicks. I'm a sophomore majoring in English, and I'm from Pennsylvania. Thank you, President Daniels. According to the Census and the Health Resources and Services Administration, 26.1 million Americans lacked health insurance in 2019, and 14 million lived in areas without access to adequate medical services. With the coronavirus pandemic costing millions their jobs, these numbers are only going to increase. What steps do you believe are necessary to ensure every citizen has access to insurance and health care, as well as address the disadvantages low income and marginalized communities face when seeking care? Well, I am. Uh... So I'll do it real fast. I authored the alternative to Obamacare and I offered and I brought one through the house a couple of years ago. I would do refundable tax credits, which means a voucher to buy health insurance for everybody, um, more for the poor, less for the wealthy. And I would uh, change the way the insurance rules work so that you can get more affordable insurance. And I would have risk pools that cover the, the, the people with, with real big illnesses. So if government just bucks up and pays for the people who have catastrophic illnesses, you can dramatically lower the price of insurance for everybody else so that um, that tax credit goes really far and everybody can get affordable care. I could go on and on. I'll leave it at that. Plus transparency on pricing and quality. So you have true competition. In Milwaukee, the, the, the variation on prices on MRIs is like 300% based on who you are and where you go. That's ridiculous. You need more choice and competition, universal um, vouchers or tax credits, and then cover the people with with deep, deep illnesses so that insurance can be priced like um, other insurances. I'll Good. leave it at that. Senator, I, mean, go ahead. As, I would say, number one, you've got to lower the cost to make insurance affordable for everyone. How you do that is you embrace technology. You start looking at where the waste, fraud and abuse is in the healthcare system. And you start embracing wellness strategies because Every one mm -hmm. of us as individuals in this country have an obligation to reduce our exposure to chronic conditions. 70% of healthcare costs uh, relate to chronic conditions, most of which are avoidable. And we don't talk enough about lowering healthcare costs. It's a drag on our economy. It's way too big of a percentage of our economy. We need to move beyond it so we can do other great things in our economy. But we have to look at the failure of employer-based insurance and why that isn't working right now, whether it's in the gig economy or whether it is in, in unaffordability when you become unemployed. And so there has to be a replacement mechanism for that insurance on access. No one knows this better than we do who come from rural America. We've got to embrace the technology that could bring access. We've got to look at how we can in, engage the public health community in providing local health care services in rural areas. Thank you. Uh, let me point out the last question uh, came from a member of the Young Democrats, and we thank her for an excellent question. Next one, please. Hello, my name is Tyler Sweezy. I'm a senior from Indianapolis, Indiana, studying finance and journal management. Thank you, President Daniels, Mr. Ryan, and Mrs. Heitkamp for being willing to speak to us tonight. According to the Congressional Budget Office, in fiscal year 2019, the U.S. government made $375 billion in interest payments on its debt. While there's much talk of defense spending being the main driver of the debt, at 3.41% in fiscal year 2019, 
U.S. defense spending as a percentage of GDP is close to its post-1960 low. In actuality, the main drivers of the national debt are mandatory spending programs, such as our major health care programs and Social Security, which combined were 10.7% of GDP in fiscal year 2019. These programs were already facing insolvency in the not-too-distant future, and COVID-19 has only hastened that trend. What are the roadblocks to Congress taking prudent steps to reform our entitlement programs and get control over the national debt? Senator, you want to go first because uh, I know Paul's in the starting blocks on this one, but uh, why, don't, why don't you uh, preempt him? Well, what I would say is the first thing you need to do when you look at the projection or the trajectory of debt is you need to get health care costs under control. Um, you can say, well, these are mandated spending programs, so we're going to ratchet back. The bottom line is these are people, especially in the Medicare area, that need health insurance, who have earned health insurance, and we have to take a look at how we're going to lower the cost of delivering that product to them, because health care is a major driver of debt. But what I will tell you, and this is where Paul and I will agree, any dime spent in addition on interest is a dime we can't spend on a moonshot for cancer, we can't spend on something else. We have to have a a common understanding that this debt is going to crush us. And the debt itself is the largest intergenerational transfer of responsibility. But I also say it's the largest interracial transfer of responsibility. Us old white people are building it up and younger, more diverse people are going to pay the bill. And so what I would say is we need to have a true commitment on debt and deficit. We need to really make it understandable for the public why we need to address it. But we also need to understand these programs that you're talking about have in fact been addressed. And, and Paul can talk to what uh, Representative Larson's doing over in the House. I think a lot of good leadership on Social Security is coming at the House, a lot of bipartisan leadership. Mm -hmm. So I'll just turf that to him. Paul, I know you've Tyler. given occasional thought to these questions. Well, yeah, you, this is the Mitch Daniels, Paul Ryan question right here. Um, Tyler, you asked the most important question facing your generation. I'll be as brief as I can. Um, this is existential. It will affect your generation's, just your prosperity and your ability to have a, have a good life and a good economy. Um, it really kind of does come down to healthcare. Uh, if you look at our healthcare entitlement programs, those are the greatest chunk of our unfunded liabilities. And we have an important social contract that needs to be met, promises made to people, like my mom on Medicare and Social Security. So the question is, how do you keep these promises? How do you fulfill the mission of these programs without totally bankrupting the country and driving us into debt? I think the biggest, best, best answer is reforming these programs to bring more market-based solutions to them, which brings more choice, more competition, and brings down the cost escalation to them. Um, I'm proud of the fact that when, when I ran the House and when I was budget chair and ways and means chair, every session, the House passed a budget that balanced the budget and paid off the national debt premium support for Medicare, um, important reforms to Medicaid, uh, tax reforms, budget reforms, spending caps. So there's a way to do this. Um, the problem is we could never get it anywhere else but the House of Representatives in those days. It is really hard for politicians to touch these third rails of embracing these reforms. Um, this and immigration reform are the two big ones that got away from me that I think if we solve, we got a great 21st century for America. My last comment is, um, getting healthcare right, which is market-based solutions, in my opinion. But I think the way to do this, politically speaking, and I hate uh, saying this because I always thought this was a political punt, is a commission like the Greenspan Social Security Commission or the Base Closing Commission. I was on Bowles Simpson, and it was it, it was disavowed the minute it came out with its result by the president then Obama and the speaker then Pelosi, a commission that requires an up or down vote on its findings by both houses that cannot be filibustered, I think, frankly, is the is the best political path to getting this done. Um, Mitt Romney, and I, he's got a Democrat. I can't remember who his lead Democrat is, but it's there's a bipartisan bill to do just this now in the Senate, and it's been introduced in the House by the Problem Solver Caucus. So that, to me, is the best political solution that's available right now. Thank you for a great question. Next one, please. Hi, my name is John Pabas Denerline. I'm a junior from Northfield, Illinois, about 25 miles north of Chicago, studying aeronautical and astronautical engineering. And before I say anything, I also want to thank President Daniels for hosting and moderating this event. Our two speakers are taking the time and effort to be here, and the Political Discourse Club for all their work in organizing it. I'm the president and campus coordinator of Turning Point USA at Purdue, and here's our question on behalf of our chapter. In the past five years, 
there have been 99 disinvitation attempts from universities to various invited speakers, the majority of which leaned right of the aisle. As we're seeing a rise in political polarization overall, it's also seen in the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education's disinvitation database that the rate of disinvitations has been increasing since 2015, and it is expected that this issue will continue on both sides, unless we're able to find a way to tone down hostility towards each other. When public schools either disinvite or outright, or outright block speakers from coming to campus based on their speaking topic or their political views, what's your response and how could you suggest that students go about ensuring that there is diversity of thought on campus and that their school administration is holding true to their First Amendment rights and obligations to their students. Thank you. I appreciate your response. Senator, you were a state official one time. Uh, you go first. Well, I, I, I don't understand why administrations would disinvite anyone. Um, uh, I understand that, uh, you know, people may have uh, tough and, uh, you know, gut feelings about things, but the absolute worst thing, in fact, it would be contrary to what I just said, which is, you know, embrace the diversity, understand each other, stand next to each other. Now, in my opinion, there's a spectrum of, of um, what you do. If the Oath Keepers, if you said, I want to invite the Oath Keepers, I would say that's a very bad idea because it legitimizes a hate group. And so there are groups that should not be legitimized by a campus invitation to speak because they don't belong in the discourse. But I think, you know, you look at the, um, uh, the, the movement on anyone speaking on behalf of Israel that's happening on campuses. I think that's wrong. I, I may disagree with some uh, practices, but let's, let's have the dialogue and let's see if we can change minds of people who may already agree, but now would, would disagree with, um, with the right presentation. So um, I, I, think, I think this isn't so much driven by students as it is by uh, reluctant and hesitant uh, administrators who don't want to take the heat for letting it happen. Paul. Yeah, I mean, we have this tyrannical intolerance that is creating this radical conformity that is very dangerous to a pluralistic society. Um, like I can experience my own experience is just going to University of Wisconsin, which, you know, I grew up season ticket holder. My family, uh, you know, I get picketed. They laid down in front of my truck when I went to, to the University of Wisconsin to talk about entitlement reform, like the last questioner. It's gotten radicalized. It's very dangerous. Um, it, a good friend of mine, Jonah Goldberg, wrote this book, Liberal Fascism, which I think is a great book that sort of talks about the origins of this. And if you can allow this kind of radical intolerance to, to proliferate, you're going to stifle pluralism, civil debate, and dissension. And um, it really is up to, to, to the leaders of these academic institutions to build these tolerance codes. I, University of Chicago has a pretty good one. Mitch, I'm sure you do, knowing you. I apologize for not knowing what it is. But uh, these schools have got to open this up and allow d differing views and different thought to occur. Um, it is very dangerous. It's very alarming. And frankly, as a dad whose kids are just starting going to college, I look at this and I'm like, there's no way I want my kid to go to college if, if, if these people are being, you know, heismaned at the, at the campus door and cannot make it onto campus. I'm not talking about crazy white supremacists. I'm mean, just talking about like normal, you know, conservatives trying to go on campus and explain the virtue of freedom. You know, Nick and McKeon ethics and Bastier and, you know, v Mises and Hayek. Those are the things I teach at Notre Dame. I'm glad they let me do that. Uh, but, but a lot of campuses don't even allow that stuff to be taught anymore. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to let this go by without saying I, I was at Harvard and disinvited to speak at a group at Harvard because they didn't share some of my political views. So um, this cuts both They're ways. Crazy stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I won't take time to defend, uh, you know, pusillanimous uh, uh, administrations, uh, Paul, I, uh, somebody else can speak for them, but I will tell you that uh, Purdue, Purdue's Board of Trustees uh, made this the first public university to embrace the Chicago principles verbatim, the ones you referenced, and that, that is our code here, and I, we try to live up to it. Uh, next question. I encourage My you to go to Madison. My name is Praveena Ravi, and I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm a senior majoring in political science, and I'm a representative of Pi Sigma Alpha. Thank you, President Daniels. I also wanna take a moment to thank Speaker Ryan and Senator Heitkamp for being a part of this event. My question concerns my home state, 
where millions of Texans lost power for over 24 hours during winter storm Uri this past week. It is important to note that ERCOT, the Texas electrical grid, was deregulated, privatized, and removed from interconnected networks to avoid federal regulation and increase profits for a small number of wealthy individuals. In light of these recent events, it seems like grid deregulation may have been a mistake. What are your thoughts on this? And to what extent should federal funding be allocated towards equitable green infrastructure investments going forward? Thank you. Thank you. Paul, you wanna go first? Sure, um, I wouldn't say that the answer is more in new regulation. It's just proper rules of the road. If I'm not mistaken, my daughter goes to college down there and she just, she, she just came up here for the week because her dorm you know, shut down. Uh, I would say they need to be better prepared for, for winter storms, you know, cut the tree branches over the power lines. There are a lot of rules that they should have been living by to be prepared for such a thing. But more regulation, I don't think, is, is the knee-jerk reaction. Um, proper regulation is the knee-jerk reaction. Not knowing enough about the regulatory system in Texas, I really don't feel equipped to say where they fell short on the regulations. But just a gag reflex on over-regulation, I think, is a bad idea because it would just raise costs. With respect to um, encouraging green energy, I think um, the answer for government's role is basic research, not applied research, meaning fund basic research that gets, um, uh, get, gets new breakthrough technologies going versus picking winners and losers in the actual marketplace and trying to, and to stack the deck. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's interesting because you raised one area where um, Speaker Ryan and I have had a few d disagreements, and that would be on things like the production tax credits and the investment tax credits that have um, driven, um, uh, I think, uh, more and more power towards renewables, whether you agree with that or not. It definitely has had the intended, uh, con uh, it has had the intended consequences of those uh, policies. And, you know, the, 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 I've done a lot of work on the electric grid. In fact, I sat on the board of directors of a, of a subsidiary corporation um, to a large generation and transmission power co-op that did 11 states. If you said North Dakota is going to only rely on itself in the power grid to provide power, that is foolish, foolish, foolish. And one thing Texas is finding out to basically divorce itself from the rest of the country so you can have, um, to, you can say we're, we're going it alone isn't the right way, especially in a time when we're seeing the dramatic consequences of climate. Um, whether it is ice storms in Texas that take out the power grid, whether it's rising sea levels and, and increased storms and tornadoes in, uh, you can disagree with me, but I think we're seeing weather patterns that should have us all concerned. And so we need resiliency. One thing I really agreed with the Obama administration on is when Ernie Moniz did his uh, quadrennial energy policy, he didn't focus on the source of energy. He focused on the lack of infrastructure in terms of delivering energy and how that makes us less resilient and how it makes our power grid less reliable. And so this is very complicated, but the answer is not for Texas to go it alone. The answer is for all of us to be interconnected the way we would, but goodness sakes, that's why we have an interstate commerce system so that we can uh, uh, share the opportunities um, across state borders. So Texas made some really bad decisions and um, I think they're gonna have to clean up the mess. Um, that uh, resulted as a result of those bad decisions that Texas made. Thanks. We're literally down to our last couple minutes. There were some follow-up questions, and I'm just going to select one, from, and it came from the Discourse Club. It's, very, it's directed to you, Senator, um, and it raises, I think, an issue that uh, is very central to our current problems. For Senator Heitkamp, the club asks, as a Democrat who served what has become a predominantly Republican state, what would your advice be to potential candidates seeking office in areas where they are in the political minority? And before you answer, I just want to uh, ask you to, to take into account the fact that yours, in, as you told us before, is, it's become the party of the wealthy. The 10 richest congressional districts in the country are all represented by your party, 44 of the top 50. And the financial edge in the last election uh, between the two parties was three to one. So this is a, a huge change from what you knew and what we knew. And uh, I just want to read you 
uh, the, this quote from a, a Democratic pollster in the recent New Yorker reflecting on people she had talked to in Ohio and Wisconsin where she had run successful Democratic campaigns. People told her they think they're better than we are. They're PC, they're virtue signalers, they lecture us while they're screwing us, they're in charge and they're ripping us off. Do you hear that in North Dakota? And how would you win an election there um, it, it, from the uh, minority under those circumstances? <laughs> if only, if only I had the answer to that question, you wouldn't be calling me former Senator Heidi Eichamp. Um, You know, this is really complicated and it's complicated because we've gotten more, our votes have become more aligned with our party identification. When I ran in 12, about 20% of identified Republicans in North Dakota would cross over and vote for me and did. Um, when I ran in uh, for re-election in 18, it was only 4%. And so what I would say for all of you who say, I want to go back home to Idaho and run, I'd say go back home and decide what you're going to do in your community. Go back home and uh, decide what, you know, what issues you want to take on and how you're going to work within uh, your state and then build that reputation for being somebody who gets things done, regardless of the party label. And don't be afraid to say why you're a Democrat. I tell you, you know, that cable that I was talking about, that the Democrats get up and leave or they just hang their head because they feel so beaten down. And to have a bright star from Purdue come home and work on whatever, you know, kind of new power solution or a new innovation of agriculture and then say, I'm running and I'm running as a Democrat because I believe in these principles, but I'm running because I believe in Idaho. And so I would say, always put your state first. Don't put your political party first. Lead with your ideas. Lead with your personality. Don't lead with, I'm doing this so that I can go and vote with Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi or Mitch McConnell. Uh, you know, that, that's, not, that's what's wrong with our governance. And so I would say, call me afterwards and we'll brainstorm how we're going to get you into the uh, running in a, in a state like North Dakota. And I'm hoping that by the time you make that leap as a college student, that um, the work that we've done to expand the understanding of uh, people in the, in the country of the Democratic Party and that, that we've got the Democratic Party to listen more to working people, we'll have plowed some ground for you. So um, give us a shot to build, build back the base um, of working class people and, and go for it. It's a wonderful answer. And even though we're just slightly over, let me ask each of our panelists, a lightning round fashion, uh, just speaking to young people today as citizens, whether or not they ever in, uh, aspire to a uh, public career, um, what would you uh, in, encourage them in a few words with regard to uh, the task we're leaving them of drawing this country together? Uh, Paul, why don't you go first? Don't lead with your emotions. Uh, boil things down to irreducible primaries. Check your premises. And just know that the other person that doesn't agree with you is not a bad person. It's just a person that doesn't agree with you. Listen to them. You got two ears. You got one mouth. Use it in that proportion. And Senator. You can have an ideology, but first have an idea. First have a method and first and always, always, always respect whoever you're standing next to, respect whoever you're talking to and understand they may have a different perspective, but guess what? It's a perspective that you can learn from. Thank you both. You know, in, the, in my most pessimistic moments, I think of people like the two, our two guests tonight. I recognize that in, uh, through uh, ups and downs, this country has uh, somehow produced wonderful public servants like these who think about the public interest, not their own self-interest. I know uh, the generation of, that I see every day here at Purdue is going to do the same thing. I want to thank once again the Political Discourse Club, uh, not just for this evening, but for your reason for being, uh, which is such a great example. And uh, I hope you'll thrive. And obviously, uh, we will be happy to support your activities any chance we get. Thanks to the audience for tuning in and for your concern. Uh, for uh, uh, a rejuvenated, more healthy uh, political process in America. Good night. Good night. Thank you.